thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, my name is Joel Wallenstrom. I'm the general manager at Wicker. And I'm here today doing three of my favorite things. Uh, number one is talking about the cool things we're building uh, here at Amazon, AWS. Number two is sharing a room full of people who uh, I think you've self-selected as people who wanna do good things for the world, make a positive impact. And I think most importantly, number three is uh, be joined by somebody who's actually dedicated his life to making that positive impact. That's Robo Lopez, who will be joining us later. Just a little housekeeping. Take all the pictures of me you want, um, but not of Roe when he gets on stage. We're trying to keep that profile low. Um, so that's just, I'll, I might do that again if we have more people trickle in, but that's just one of the housekeeping issues here. Okay, so um, on to the first topic, talking about what we're building. So first of all, Wicker was acquired about a year ago by AWS. Um, Wicker started out as a consumer and then encrypted messaging product. So to help me understand the room a little bit better, raise your hand if you are familiar with end-to-end -end encryption. Okay, so it seems like pretty much everybody. Raise your hand if you use end-to-end -end encrypted communication products. Keep them up if you use them for business communications. Keep them up if your company wants, it has a policy allowing you to use them for business communications. Okay, so gradually we're seeing the hands go down and down and down. So that, that talks a little bit about the Wicker story. End-to-end um, -end encryption is a relatively new thing. I would say, you know, it existed in white papers a while ago, and then we got these pocket computers that let us do more compute on nodes, on the ends, and that let us do all the cryptograph, cryptography encryption we needed on these nodes, not on a centralized server. That became very exciting for a lot of us in the security community, and we started using these phones, these uh, nodes, I'll call them, to protect communications differently. You could only access the data when it was on either end. Couldn't get it from the server. My background is 20 years of having companies that break into things. We would break into servers. Right? We, we, end end encryption was a powerful thing. We couldn't break the math, and so that's a really exciting tool. It's a powerful tool, um, and it gives the end user this concept of zero knowledge for the service provider. When the packets are being transferred, the intermediary can't access them. In this case, Wicker can't access the data, or nor can AWS. Um, but it first became a consumer product. That was the first manifestation of end-to-end -end encryption. We, in 2018, decided that what we were, what we were gonna do is build an enterprise communication product. And we started thinking about what were the requirements, and we came up with our own requirements, and then we went out and started talking to customers and asked what their requirements were. Number one was they just needed to stop using consumer products in their enterprise. They needed to figure out a way to do that. And that was whether it was a government customer that had a FOIA requirement or a corporate customer who had litigation hold requirements. It, you know, it's not a trivial thing to just not retain data when you need to. The other thing was just managing users in and out of conversations and in and out of networks. It's the, you know, a good way to think about that. A mental model is we have our personal email, but when you have a job, if you leave that company, you don't get the email anymore. It's very difficult to do that with consumer products. So there needed to be some management around it. Um, restricting access to content that was already shared, so that's another thing. If somebody leaves your company, being able to restrict access to what was previously communicated. Um, and then just really hooking into the administrative needs of like how do you work with SSO or two-factor authentication, all those enterprise tools that are, are pretty typical. So this is, this is what we built. Um, we built this, you know, essentially one of our, one of our customers the other day said it's like, you know, the, the video collaboration product and the um, chat application product had a security baby. So it's got all the enterprise features that you would find in most collaboration products. It works on all the devices um, and operating systems that you would see typically in an enterprise. Um, this compliance piece that I brought up, I'll talk about a little bit later, that's a really big difference in the end-to-end -end encryption space, and we'll talk about how we do that. We also, because we have a lot of our customers in the public sector, needed to have flexibility in hosting models, so you can run this on-prem or self-hosted. Um, always have end-to-end -end encryption, and 
because of a lot of our downrange use cases, um, we built sort of like obfuscation techniques so that you can use this product and suite of functionality in um, kind of hostile networks and hostile uh, uh, geographies. So this is very simply how the product works. You have administrators who deploy and say, all of you get a product. Um, so the administrator can control who gets it, uh, has flexibility to understand that Joe's on lit hold, Susan is not, I can have you know, my data retention model be flexible based upon the company's needs. Um, the end users just see the product, right? Like they, they get to use the messaging, the calling, screen sharing, you know, a lot of voice memo usage. We see uh, location sharing, a lot of different collaboration tools that the end user sees, but they don't see a lot of the, the I guess, kind of the guts of the administration. That's done via an administrative portal. Um, so it's a lot like other enterprise communication products, it's just end-to-end -end encrypted, and the service provider doesn't provide that sort of person in, in the middle attack vector, if you will. So for those of you who are in the security industry, um, this concept of data governments, governance or retention with end-to-end -end encryption seems very foreign. Now, I was talking about zero knowledge in this you know, promise that, that is made with end-to-end uh, -end encryption that the service provider can't access it. There's security in that and there's privacy in that, but in its core, what it means is when, when Anna sends a message, only John can de decrypt it. Now, if there were five Johns, you can do that in a group setting as well. So at this point, it's the nodes. Using those phones as the nodes, that's the promise that's being made. What we've done is use something, you know, we call our compliance bot to create essentially a headless client. So that customer has said, I want to create this other user who is situationally going to retain because we have a legal requirement to do so. And that goes into a compliance server. That is all owned by the customer. Like, Wicker doesn't touch that. That's, that's outside of our purview, out of our grasp, out of our uh, control. So the customer still retains that control. The service provider, Wicker, has no ability to touch that data. So we're, we're keeping that end-to-end -end encryption promise whole in terms of saying it is the specified nodes that have the ability to uh, encrypt and decrypt the, the data. So um, I'm gonna talk about beyond just that end-to-end -end encryption, some of the other promises that we make within our products at, at Wicker. So these two products are our, our corporate products, if you will, our enterprise products. Um, AWS Wicker, which today launched as a preview, uh, which means anybody who wants to come in and kick the tires and help us with our product roadmap and learn more has an ability to do that now in terms of the, the AWS Wicker product that will be a native service eventually. And then we have Wicker Enterprise. The distinction there really is that self-hosted versus SaaS. So those, those are the, the corporate products we have. You can see, I hope, on that second line there's, there's you know, dashed lines around global federation. In 2018, when we started building this thing out, one thing that we wanted to do was kind of like that email example I brought up earlier, where I can email my corporate email from my personal device. Um, this is something kind of new in end-to-end -end encryption. I'd say all of our products are built on the same code base. They use the same cryptographic protocol so they can all talk to each other. So an enterprise customer can talk to a consumer, a free user, if need be. Now, the administrator can control that. We have customers who say, we're only gonna use this for internal communications, or we're situationally gonna open this up just to our law firm, or to our bank, or we're gonna do an acquisition, and so the whole M&A team, and when that mission is over, and Ro will talk about this a little bit in terms of missions, you can just kill those relationships, so you're not inviting people into your network full time. Um, that's what we mean by global federation. I think that's a really important aspect of what we do and what we built. Another thing that we were very, very particular about was we didn't want to build a product that was focused on a specific use case. Now, we have different functionality that we built in, and you know, I would suggest that our lo location sharing has been driven by customers who really need that, but we wanted to be extensible and we wanted to give our customers the ability to build their own encrypted workflows, if you will. So what that did is it meant that we weren't just a product for a specific 
slice of the world or a specific market segment. Rather, we were giving end-to-end -end encryption across multiple market segments. So you know, today we have enterprises using us. That's oftentimes executive communication, board level communication, crisis management. Um, government agencies use us a lot. We, our footprint in the public sector is a little different than in commercial because in the public sector, end-to-end -end encryption is a kind of a must-have in a lot of circumstances. Um, so you see that in the DOD, you see that in DHS, where that might be different in, say, financial services or healthcare. There is a very strong need within commercial markets to protect data, that is for sure. And oftentimes that can happen at executive levels. But there's not quite the same mandate as there is in the public sector. Uh, same thing goes for healthcare. So beyond just these, um, these industries, there are specific user personas, I'd say, that um, we see using our product. And you know, it's, it, it's interesting, because a lot of CISOs, w when they come to me and they're trying to explore this, like how are you gonna possibly, I guess, like uh, enable the use of end-to-end -end encryption in my corporate environment? Because ultimately what we're doing is we're trying to have access to everything. And you know, when I, the CISO, think about data, I think about um, not necessarily end-to-end -end encryption. I think about how to run you know, as much e-discovery as possible. Well, we, we still allow for that, right? Like we situationally go to them and say, whatever your corporate policies are, you can do what you want with that data and you can run those discovery tools against it. If you have policies that suggest, as we do with customers, there's certain conversations between certain employees that don't need to be retained, you can take that approach as well. That's just a governance policy that is driven by our customers, not necessarily by our encryption. Um, you know, when you need OPSEC, so a lot of our, you know, our military customers, obviously when they're downrange or they're doing, you know, they really need situational security around certain operations, they'll, they'll use our product. Uh, incident response is a place where this made sense. When I was pre-Wicker and we were doing incident response, we would use the consumer products because that's all that existed to communicate when we wanted to and needed to be out of band. So that concept of out of band communications is something where end-to-end -end encryption has lived for a long time. Now there's just some controls around how this is um, distributed out to users. Um, data protection officers, that's a relatively new title, um, but that's somebody who also comes to us asking about how can I use this tool to help me with my job. Um, you know, there's a, there's a retention requirement, but also companies have deletion requirements. My old company, we would enter contracts where we had to promise that everything was deleted after X number of days of our project or of our response. That was just a legal requirement for us. End-to-end -end encryption, just killing that key material on the nodes does that mathematically. You have that total assurance that you're in compliance with that contract. Um, and then, you know, I think when you look at like a public affairs situation, when there's crisis management, it's a really good tool that's used situationally. It's kind of a break glass moment, right? Like something is happening. Um, we can build and we have customers who build automated bots to um, build out those crisis management workflows. Something happened, everyone in the Southeast is gonna get this file at this time. Think about like hooking into products like Datadog, if you will, something like that to automate that workflow. Um, we've had a number of companies who have built these automated workflows. Uh, we have a, um, a healthcare bot that was created for people who are downrange and need to provide military care in the field. That was built by a partner, not by us on top of our platform. Um, a North American democracy built a voting app during the pandemic. So they actually conducted remote voting by building something on top of our application that was end-to-end uh, -end encrypted. There's a law enforcement um, organization who built workforce automation so that they could identify who needed what materials wind and send them to the place where they were required without exposing where those people were. We, we're not trying to, at AWS Wicker, tell everybody exactly how to use end-to-end -end encryption. What we're doing is we're creating extensibility and a platform for people to understand that they can end-to-end -end encrypt their data and they can get different sort of data security. So, I bring all that up and I was fast, I was intentionally fast because I think the reason we're all here, at least the reason I'm here is to hear Ro talk about the, the good things he and Freedom Shield are doing around the world. Um, we have been working with Freedom Shield for a long time now. 
Um, it's been, um, you know, an amazing journey because uh, what they do and the difference they make in the world is unquestionable. And, um, you know, there's nothing better than giving a guy like Ro a platform to talk to you all about this so that you can learn a little bit more about what they do. Um, I think it's great that they're using our tools. I, I want to continue to innovate so that they can continue to use our tools. And I'm just going to remind you we're not going to do pictures now because I'm going to exit and Ro's going to come on. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, thank you. So good morning uh, to you guys. Thank you for, uh, I know there's probably been, uh, there could have been some other classes you could have gone to, but thank you for, for coming here today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how um, our uh, organization uses Wicker uh, for the work that we do uh, around the world. And then uh, we're going to open it up to some questions for both Joel and I. Um, at that point, if there's more sensitive stuff that you guys want to know, we'll probably hopefully be able to cut the feed and answer some questions for you guys. Um, we are an organization that's been around now about 13 years. Um, we've, a lot of people have not heard of, have heard of us, and that's a good thing. Um, I'm a former FBI special agent. I was with the FBI uh, in the El Paso divisions, uh, San Juan division, and um, finished up in the Dallas division, which is home for us, and it's also the, our headquarters. Um, we currently have offices through Freedom Shield in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Southeast Asia. We have about four international offices that we do uh, things out of. Um, I would say that our, our bread and butter right now is, is the, the people that come to volunteer with us uh, come from, from all walks of life. Uh, we have a lot of former military, um, uh, a lot of soldiers in the military, uh, retired, a lot of officers, uh, a lot of former bureau guys, former agency people, um, a lot of folks like yourself that have just an incredible cyber background that come to, to be able to help us with certain things. And uh, we have a lot of analysts, uh, probably 40, 50 analysts that, that have just been a part of us for, for 13 years. So we can throw a lot of the, that kind of power and, and just the knowledge that you guys bring to the table at, at a problem in a certain country. Um, when we do come into these countries, we're able to work with the, the national police forces. Um, we see what their needs are. We don't come in and say, here's our checklist you know, of what we need from you. It's, hey, what can we offer you? A lot of times when you're dealing with foreign governments, you have, obviously there's ITAR rules and things that we have to uh, follow, which we do. Um, there's certain things that we can train them that, that aren't trade craft, things like that, especially from, from my background. Um, but what's really cool is we can bring a team in that has intelligence background, cyber background, law enforcement background, and we can work with the, with the national police forces and say, look, this is our currency. We're not going to charge you a dime. You know, what is it you need? And it could be as simple as teaching them handcuffing techniques to uh, teaching them organized crime investigations or criminal enterprise theory, things that they don't normally do as part of their investigations. Um, a lot of times when we already come in with a knowledge of who the threat is in their country, it could be a Russian organized crime group, uh, 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 the triads, Yakuza groups like that. We tend to focus over the last 13 years, um, we had evolved now where we're strictly targeting uh, or looking at organized crime groups that are trafficking in women and children, uh, insurgency groups and terrorist groups that are out there uh, in these nations that we operate in that are also trafficking in children. When you talk about human trafficking, we're talking about child soldiers, child soldier recruitment. We're looking at organ trafficking of these very people. Um, labor trafficking, we don't focus a lot on that unless it turns into sex trafficking. So sex trafficking has just become a, a big problem. I, I think in 1993 is when it first hit the radar, at least became a little more vocal in the, in, uh, the war in Bosnia, um, where um, there's actually a movie that's put out called Whistleblower by a, a, a female police officer out of Georgia, I believe, had gone on contract to work in Bosnia, and she uncovered uh, what was going on with Albanian organized crime, and I think that's when at first people started paying attention. We started in uh, 2009, it was Thanksgiving Day. Um, I received a, an email uh, from a nurse friend of mine who I had, we had been providing food to. She was traveling to orphanages around um, Africa, and two weeks prior to Thanksgiving, she had visited an orphanage where uh, there was a, a, a mother, the house mother, there was about 30, uh, 33 kids, all young, all 10, 14 and younger, uh, orphans. And um, the email came in Thanksgiving Day, uh, probably 2 or 3 in the morning, 
and I'm sleeping here in America, best you know country on earth. And um, she says that 15 men had broken into the orphanage to rob the place, and they wound up beating the, the house mother almost to death. They put her in a coma, and then they wound up uh, gang raping a 14 year old and a 10 year old little girl. And um, when you hear that kind, when you read that kind of stuff, there, there's just this righteous anger that brews up. That's saying, "Well, wait a minute, th this can't be happening." When there's people like us in this room that can make a difference just with our own backgrounds. So immediately I called a friend of mine. He's a former uh, um, uh, Naval Special Warfare guy. And then I called my dad and I said, Dad, I'm starting a, a group to, tomorrow. And, you know, we're going to call it this. And, and by Monday we filed our paperwork and by we were operating by Tuesday already. And initially we started off just securing orphanages around the world. Um, I'll fast forward to today, we support probably over 6,000 children in about 14 countries. And we handle all their kidnappings of their directors and of the children. Uh, pro bono, we handle all their extortions because they get a lot of stuff like that, pro bono. There's always a requirement in a nation for you to put up how much you're earning and how much your organization is bringing in. Well, bad guys also know how to use the internet. So they start valuing, oh, you bring in X amount of millions of dollars, we'll just kidnap the director and you know, we'll get the money anyway. So we come in and help them with that. We help secure all their orphanages and things like that. So we still have, have that program as part of our Freedom Shield Foundation mission. Um, so a little bit on, on, and this is what I just talked about. This is some of the stuff we've done uh, over the years. Um, I would like to say that I, I, the word rescue is a really strong word uh, coming from having been on three tactical teams with the FBI. A rescue is usually the victim is in danger, and then the guy that's doing the rescuing is usually in danger. So there's a there's a danger to both ends. So uh, rescue gets kind of overused in in this trade, um, like and and the are used in your normal sentences. So we actually moved. Uh, so I'll tell you, a rescue is just how I describe it. A recovery might be us going to find a say a Yazidi who was left in Syria, but ISIS is no longer in control of her. We know where she's at. We may go knock on the door and say, hey, you need to let this girl and her mom go. We're taking her back home. That's more of a recovery where there is no, it's like a personnel recovery type deal. Um, we look at an exfiltration. You know, again, you look at Ukraine. We've done work in Ukraine where um, a lot of orphans that were in harm's way, those weren't exfils because we weren't bringing them out of the country. These were more evacuations. We we're bringing them to safety. Whereas an exfiltration is more actually grabbing somebody and pulling them out because they're in harm's way. It's, it goes back to there's danger to both parties. So we said, you know what, how can we do this and simplify without telling everybody, oh, this is how many rescues we did. And we don't publicize, uh, and I think that's why we've been around a long time, is we just stay, try to stay under the radar. Wicker has definitely been a big product at helping us do that. Um, but we like using the word, the terms captives freed. And that, because we do negotiations uh, because of the guys we have on the team, we can negotiate with organizations that are holding potential suicide bombers. They're usually children um, or child soldiers. So we, we also do negotiations with these groups. We've developed a lot of uh, uh, sources around the world uh, in a particular country. We, we work with the national police or with the military. We'll develop sources, assets, resources, things like that that then can help us to conduct the recoveries of these children or of these women. Um, so that's kind of kind of the met, uh, methodology there. And I'll let you look at some, you can look at these slides where we've been, and later on, if you guys want to talk a little more detail, we can. Um, you know, trafficking, trafficking is a problem. You guys can get online today and read the, uh, the TIP report, the Trafficking in Persons report that's put out by the United States government every year. You can see where the United States sits in it. Most countries, you're either a source country, a transit country, or a destination country. So the source country would be um, like the Philippines. The Philippine, Philippine nationals are probably represented in every labor workforce in every country in the world. All right, so 60% of all the cases that come out of the Philippines where we have an office are labor trafficking related. What happens is it doesn't matter. We don't care if they're Muslim kids. We don't care if they're Christians. We don't care if they're agnostic. It doesn't matter if they're children being trafficked. We're going to intervene. So we have a lot of issues uh, with just all. You, it doesn't. There's not a denomination that's. But you see, we see a lot of minority groups that end up getting trafficked by their own uh, people of the same faith. Um, 
so a Philippines might be a source country because it's sending people to other places. Where if you look at this map here, um, you see people coming out of Russia, Germany, uh, they might end up in Germany, or they may sit in a country like Poland as a transit nation where they're held until they're moved to the final destination country. All right, so what do you guys think? Where do you, where do you think the U.S. sits? We're definitely a, uh, a destination country. There's a lot of demand here. Um, I would say there's so many numbers. I'm not even giving numbers for international victims here. I will tell you that the majority of people being trafficked in the United States are, are the average age is 13, 14 years old of, the, of a traffic victim in the U.S. Uh, when you look at the numbers, anywhere from 400,000, I've seen as high as 800,000 runaways a year. Um, some of these kids will be contacted within 48 hours by a trafficker who knows where to find them, where they're going to be hanging out, what they need woo them for about 30 days, and then they finally ask them to do something for them that involves, which then it becomes trafficking. Um, so you can look at these countries. You know, it, it's really interesting because if you were to, uh, to uh, look at these maps on human trafficking and you overlaid them with a drug trafficking uh, route, the routes, you would see that they're pretty much identical, okay? Certain organizations out there may move guns and drugs separately from money or move women separately from that but then ultimately they end up, um, some groups move them all at the same time, so it's very lucrative for them, okay? All right, so let's talk a little bit about Wicker and, and how we've used it. Um, because of the type of work we do, we're very concerned with who we're gonna make mad <laughs> in, this, in this business. Uh, usually when you start affecting the bottom dollar for an organization, you, you tend to have a little bit more uh, uh, you're, you're, you're seeing a little bit more on the radar for them. And um, we were having trouble early on with how do we keep the things secure? How do we conduct our, our, quick, our quick missions that we have to do? A lot of what we do um, is train people in country, nationals in that country. We'll help them with equipment, technology, maybe some funding, uh, planning, operational planning, maps, things like that. And that same source information is coming in on a particular group and those nationals, um, they, we could be working in conjunction with the National Police Force or we could be doing it with our groups and um, they affect the recovery, okay? So for me to tell you which to, today that we go in and we do, you know, kick in doors and stuff, that's not how we operate. Um, you do that in a country, you'll get jammed up. Very, very, very simply said, you will, you start breaking international laws and you're gonna end up in jail. You won't be coming home. So it's very important for us to make sure we're not paying ransoms to make sure that we're not um, getting thrown out of the country and to make sure that whatever risk we're inheriting, um, that we're prepared for it. So Wicker has helped, has helped us um, with taking on that risk. All right, when we look at some of these operations, um, because a lot of the, the threats change daily, uh, Wicker has allowed us to, to basically communicate with either our teams in country who then have people that they need moved, and um, it's able we're able to share the actual location, do it with confidence that we're not that we're not going to be intercepted on that location. So there's a lot of other stuff that we we employ um, when we can't use communications, but Wicker has been a big deal for us. I think we've used it now for I want to say five or six years at least, and it, it's protected a lot of our pickup locations because we can talk directly even from the United States or in country to to our person who's on the ground about to, to, to pick up and transport a victim to a safe house or something like that. Um, so the location piece has been, has been a big deal for us. Um, we can pick them up where they're at. We're able to obviously speak to, there's a voice memo function uh, on Wicker that's obviously to trans, transmit a little faster. Uh, if any of you guys are translators in, in other languages, we can certainly use your help as well if you, know, if you decide to help volunteer, if you wanna volunteer with us. Um, the voice memos will have people say, hey, we're not gonna, we don't have time to type this, let's just leave a memo. So we usually have tra uh, translators on the spot that can then translate whatever we're picking up. Um, so this, is, this has really helped us a lot. This feature is, is amazing. Um, one of the things that Joel was, had brought up was, was, was so true that because we have so many quick hit missions or things that have to go fast, it's so easy to get people on and then get, get to then delete them immediately. Um, 
for those of you guys that aren't familiar with all the other products, you have, you have Wicker Me, and then we have Wicker Pro, and then I think it's Wicker Enterprise. And uh, what I didn't know, and I learned just talking to the guys yesterday and today, is that besides being com you know, compatible, you, know, you can bring people in and out of your network, which we have. Um, I think two years ago, I was given the honor of being made, having been made an admin, so I can you know, bring people on and off it as, as, uh, as I see fit. But uh, it's, we're, it's easy to share uh, operational plans. Everything we do has an operations order. Uh, we've kind of put the best practices together of, of military guys and former federal agency guys, and we try to come up with the best, just the best practices all the way around, okay? And I, what I love about this, obviously, all the, uh, everything's in real time, which is fantastic. Right now, um, we operate, we work with people in the underground churches, and they could be anywhere in the Middle East where it is, might, may be illegal to, to have any other faith but what, what, what's listed by the country. So with, with this, we're able to communicate straightforward. Um, there are cases that we have seen it uh, early on where Wicker was it, it is now, and early on where we're, where we're having to use a VPN in that country, they don't have to do it now. And what I love about this, um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the open access is that, is that siphon technology. Um, this helps us in places like a Pakistan or in Afghanistan because when, when you have a country, let's say like an Iran or a China or, or anybody has a capability similar to the U.S. to intercept communications, this allows your traffic to look like normal HTTP traffic, which is so important because in these countries, if one of these governments is, is watching, they're gonna see the encrypted tools pop up over the normal traffic. So this was probably, I would, I would say, one of the best features that, that's helped us has been this, to be able to communicate and with confidence that people in that country can, can share what's going on, especially since we handle their exfiltrations and things, if, if things go bad in those countries, we're able to pull them out as well. Um, all right. The Wicker console, again, being admin, there's a lot, there's a lot to have access to. Uh, I really hope that those of you guys that haven't used this or, uh, or have used it in the past, and, but went away from it, to come back to it, the, the, what I love about this, this company has been that it seems like there's an update of something better literally every month, there's, or you know, something new is being added to it, and I go, how much more can you do? You know, if we could send Wicker out to just do the, the rescue operations for us, that'd be fantastic. Joel, I don't know if your team's available or not, but while well, you guys are at it. Um, but uh, it also allows us to get rid of all the data to erase everything that we need to erase right after we're, we're done with it. So the, the, the flex, flexible controls are um, really something that's benef uh, has benefited us. Again, it, it's kept our guys safe. We've been using it for several years now. And um, you know, one of the things when you run a nonprofit, you also have to keep your board uh, in constant contact with you, especially if you you need approvals for certain things. So our board meetings are also conducted on Wicker and we keep a trail, you know, note of everything. So we don't just meet quarterly like normal board members do. I'm constantly keeping our guys in contact so they, they know what we're doing regularly. Um, so in terms of how you can help, uh, if you, you, know, you wanna get involved, just shoot us an email. We're always looking for, for volunteers. Uh, we do have a, a pretty good vetting process before we bring people on. Um, usually before we send guys abroad, we have them spend at least a year with us domestically uh, before we, we send guys or a team abroad to work with us. Um, the work is, is risky. There's always, you know, but we have a really good risk management program that we run to, to help our, our guys not get in trouble. Um, again, I guess I, I think that's where we're at. We'll end there. Okay. Uh, what's next? Uh, again, this is the way you guys can, can get a look at the product itself.